So today we continue with the next chapter in looking at Imperial planet types that exist within the Imperium of Man. Ever since humanity expanded into the stars, it has done so with the goal of acquiring new resources, new places to colonise and expand into, much in the way that humanity always has. They would then build up a network of trade and export to support this system. In the earliest periods it seems that the existence of STC were not as universal as they would be later on. These arcs of knowledge which could apparently fabricate anything required from any material. And many early colonies were entirely cut off from humanity and developed their own cultures and localised trade networks. So it's very clear that worlds rich in a specific resource or type of material were still very necessary in this time. The vast expansion of humanity would eventually lead to a complex galactic trade network and federation that was only possible due to the discovery of warp travel. This then pushed humanity toward a reliance on this galactic network, leaving some worlds feeling secure that they did not have to be able to provide such resources for themselves and with a greatly diminished capacity for production of their necessities. Many worlds were simply just not geared towards self-sufficiency, producing what was needed for their population wasn't seen as being a priority for them nor was it a danger. It is important to remember that during the Golden Age, humanity had developed and ascended to the point where it saw itself in a very arrogant light as being essentially untouchable. Their technology and their perspective was so advanced that the idea of a collapse of their trade networks and their society just simply did not occur to them. And if something did threaten their stability, they were certain that they would be easily capable of handling such a situation. However, they did not foresee the multiple catastrophic problems that would consume humanity during this period, and those problems hit hard and in succession. So today we'll look at the resource worlds of the Imperium, and on the face of it, this might seem like a less exciting or not so important designation when compared with the other worlds of the Imperium, like Death Worlds, Astartes, Home Worlds. But in order to understand their place within the Imperium, it's worth us thinking a little about why resources are as important, if not in some cases more important, than anything else, and what consequences disruption to the key resources can create. For humanity of the Golden Age, a reliance on trade was likely not dissimilar to how many countries in our world today rely on others for much of their imports. However, it should be noted that while some countries which have relatively high imports of food, for example, do so out of necessity, others, often wealthy countries, are actually very capable of producing enough food for their population to be self-sufficient, and they choose to import food mainly as a way of creating variety for consumers. So in terms of actually providing the pure necessity, that's not really what it's about. It is worth keeping in mind though that the ability to pivot if your resources were disrupted, if that happened very quickly, it can be highly problematic and a more transitional period would obviously be very preferable to ensure stability or availability for your population. Now obviously that's something that you can do when you have other sources of food available and when you're making that decision for yourself. But what if things were abruptly cut off? If it came as a bit of a shock and you were unable to produce then enough for your population, were unable to import, that's when things become difficult and as humans during the Age of Strife would soon discover, this caused massive problems for mankind. Now this kind of issue, coupled with over time the immense and ever-growing populations that Earth and many of its new colonies with their proto-hive cities represented, would only exacerbate this dependency. The relationship between resources and population is well known, and an abundance of resources is even considered to fill people with constructive and motivational energy. A lack of such things though can create stagnation, and usually leads to an unhappy and unstable society. And this all seems very obvious when you think about it, it's a long established thing within those who study the rise and fall of human empires that when key shortages exist that cannot be quickly replaced or propped up, even complex societies will quickly deteriorate into economic distress and in ancient times past populations could even face things like famine. Now the Roman Empire and its reliance on imported food is a well known example along with how disruption to its trade network could quickly lead to civil instability. But the Imperium of Man is surprisingly more comparable, albeit in a fairly loose general sense, to our current time when it comes to resource control than our more ancient history. In fact, contrary to common belief, it's stated within the Law 6th edition that the majority of the Imperium's planets are indeed at least somewhat capable of being self-sufficient, or that they should at least aspire to be. And this is obviously not possible for every world, and this goal comes from their awareness of the threat that is posed to them by warp storms or, you know, even Xenos invasion. But these warp storms can occur seemingly at random and easily isolate planets very quickly from their local systems or the wider Imperium, and has of course occurred widely during the Age of Strife. 
Regardless though of best made preparations, these warp storms can still have a devastating impact on planets, often reducing formerly advanced worlds to feral planets, where the citizenry are reduced over centuries or even millennia back to a state of barbarism. In some cases they will even revert a society back to the level of only using stone tools. By the time these worlds are returned to the Imperium, many of its inhabitants within a society which has collapsed are barely even aware that such a thing as the Imperium exists, at best they may regard it as some mythical legend or powerful godlike race of overseers. Now for the Imperium this can make it difficult or sometimes pointless to invest the resources required to recover such worlds to their former status and so they're usually just written off and recategorized as now best describing their status. Other uses will be found for these worlds by the Imperium such as recruitment for Astartes or just general labour forces, crew for Imperial Navy vessels and so on. Now today for this video I thought it'd be worth exploring a little more detail around how a society can collapse and so that's what will follow here. If you're not interested in that and you want to get straight to the planet designations and descriptions then just skip ahead to the timestamp which is on screen right now. How though could an advanced world collapse so quickly? Surely if we were to look at our own world in its current period, it is arguably more capable of weathering storms of instability than say the empires of the ancient world. Well, this is not necessarily the case. In fact, there is to no one's surprise an abundance of philosophical thought on the matter, some of which believes that regardless of any disaster or resources available, societies will in fact over time as they become more complex inevitably collapse under the weight of that complexity and the diminishing returns associated with positive expenditure. Now if we take any shortage of a resource that is critical to a civilization at any given time, for ourselves that might be something like fuel shortages that we have seen hit several times in the past, it is not at all unusual in that situation when it occurs suddenly and hits hard, you will see often barely within 24 and 48 hours violence seen on the streets. Now I originally wasn't going to include this, but I thought it would be interesting and worthwhile to just describe one of my favourite examples of how quickly order can collapse in a civilised and advanced nation namely my own. Now this will sound like the beginning of an apocalyptic movie but this was a real event which happened some 19 years ago now toward the end of the year 2000. In just one week the UK was brought to the early stages of societal collapse. So in September 2000 the UK government are set to rise the price of fuel and inspired by similar French protests this announcement triggers a blockade of a UK fuel refinery. Day 2 and a second refinery is blockaded by a different set of protesters. The situation begins to trigger some mumbling memories within the population of a fuel crisis that happened decades earlier. The third day and despite fuel trucks not physically being prevented from leaving, tensions and emotions are very high and both the drivers and the fuel company are very wary instructing them not to operate for safety concerns. The news media are barely paying any attention confident that this will be resolved in a short order. By the fourth day of minimal fuel trucks having been delivered to stations the government begins to issue official statements that they're not going to be moved by these protests. However this triggers many citizens to panic expecting a protracted period of shortages. As a result fuel stations are fast running dry. Small scuffles between motorists at fuel stations are reported. Emergency services are instructed to slow down to only 55 miles per hour to conserve fuel. The sixth day the government are now holding crisis meetings. They want to enact emergency powers to designate fuel stations as being only usable by emergency services and essential supply vehicles for distribution of food. Full on fights are reported at fuel stations as citizens anger begins to boil over. Fuel station staff are limiting drivers to only a few pounds of fuel each. Day 7 and things begin to really fall apart now. Only a few hundred fuel trucks are delivering to stations where normally you would see several thousand. In fact 90% of UK fuel stations by day 7 are empty. Supermarkets are now rationing any remaining food because they have had no deliveries. This is made worse by people panic buying in shops. Many shelves are completely bare as people panic that they might run out of food. The UK Health Service, the NHS, is instructed to be on red alert and ready to cancel all but only the emergency cases. One hospital actually runs out of stitches necessary to perform operations. Day 8 and the protesters decide to open the refineries 
They feel that their point has been made very clearly, but the government still refuses to alter its plans for price rises. Now, this astonishing situation really happened. It seems unbelievable now, and likely the protesters could see that things were spiraling out of control quite quickly, and that maybe paying a couple of pence on fuel was not worth the country literally tearing itself apart. The surprising thing with this situation was that the government did not break up these blockades, which you really think would have happened. But regardless, the damage that this inflicted took many days before fuel stations were operating again, and in the immediate aftermath, citizens still struggled to get around even when they were trying to use public transport which also couldn't get access to fuel. Still, for the purposes of this example, the lack of the UK government doing anything about these fuel blockades is actually really helpful to illustrate how quickly things can get out of control. If this had been a real shortage or some other situation which actually prevented physically any fuel being delivered across the UK or to the UK, you can see how there would be very little to prevent things going into an almost immediate collapse. In this situation, people only had to cope for two to three days, really, without fuel. Yet in that short time, people were already struggling to get access to basic food supplies. They were fighting between themselves to get access to resources. You can imagine if you were to fast forward just one week where people still have no fuel, but were then also unable to begin finding food readily available. This is where societal order can start to collapse very quickly. So it's no exaggeration to say that this was brought to the very edge of the beginnings of societal collapse. I just think it's a very good example where you have what many would consider to be a well-structured modern country falling apart in basically a week. It's a quite disturbing example and these kind of situations are going to happen more and more as we go into the future. You will likely begin to see this in cities where we're talking about water shortages soon and these kind of things will become more and more commonplace as they currently threaten different areas of the planet where shortages lead very very quickly to disorder and disruption within a population. So when you have key resource scarcity that we are unfortunately fast heading toward is of course the basis for many apocalypse narratives like say Mad Max where an initial period of civil disruption deteriorates into wider disorder and then countries begin to look to their own interests, conflicts occur around say key resources and finally this leads into a total collapse of complex societal infrastructure which then leads to more localised governance or in the case of say Mad Max even nuclear war and just as a smaller side, yes, it was nuclear war. People often say that wasn't what happened in the world of Mad Max, and that's technically true, but it was the final result of the collapse of civilization when clearly it seemed like there was nothing left to lose, that they used nuclear weapons, and that's how the world ended up being quite as devastated as it was. But yes, it wasn't the initial starting point. But this kind of deterioration is a fairly typical premise for apocalypse narratives. It's not without also a solid basis in reality. Now, I've often said that stable order in civilization only exists when people feel that they have much to lose. This is why in countries where the citizenry are generally wealthy, as we understand that, they're employed, they have reasonable lives, a good sort of societal structure and infrastructure, stability is then maintained. But in places where this is not the case, or where over time a lack of progress can become basically intolerable, disorder will usually follow, and as we've seen, this can quickly spread to bring down the structure of complex society and once that begins to happen, it's very difficult to turn it back again. So the effect of a lack of resources should never be underestimated, nor the consequence of even a small disruption in resource availability. It also should not be underestimated what a population is capable of when they feel that their back is against the wall. Humans rarely respond well to such conditions because we are, after all, animals with still a very basic capability of reasoning no matter what people like to think. Humans, like almost any animals, are very susceptible to herd-like mentalities and when they see other people panicking, this usually leads them to also panic, and situations will then quickly deteriorate. This is how panic buying happens. In fact, often when there isn't even a problem, if just a rumour starts people to panic, it can actually create a problem which didn't exist previously. This is the danger of kind of herd-like mentality, but it also illustrates the danger of humanity's own stupidity, which is prevalent basically everywhere. And so that's how often you have ordered protests as well, become isolated initial pockets of disorder, but then that spreads and becomes riots. If this isn't contained or dispersed, the longer these kind of things go on, it will threaten wider stability. More and more people are then caught up or affected by the situation and its associated consequences. You start to have issues like lack of services, personal resources for citizens, they can't get access to work, they can't earn money. It all spreads and that's how you start to have basically the triggers which will cause a collapse which then can't be turned back again. 
Now, this might feel we're going a bit off topic, but ultimately the point that I'm trying to seek to highlight here is the precariousness of our reliance on complex societal structure and trade networks. When they're operating normally, both things seem fairly infallible, except they are not. In fact, they're very precarious. Humans are generally very good at ignoring problems until they reach a point of criticality, at which stage it's often too late to do anything. We see this repeated constantly, yet it rarely seems to be learned from. But the key point to bear in mind is that it's not true to say that countries, or say within the Imperium, its worlds are literally incapable of providing for themselves. This is usually not the case. It's more that if a key resource is abruptly cut off without warning, and then you're unable to replace that by stockpile materials or supply, say, pivoted access to alternative sources, this is when it has potential to quickly create major problems. Word of shortages often exacerbates this problem. Fear spreads to panic across a whole spectrum of societal elements from the economic to literal resources for citizens. Now this often irrational panic, which if it were not spread by citizens could even allow temporary plans to be put in place, quickly lead to deteriorating situations that can be as we already considered difficult to regain control of and maintain order. Ordinary people are not good at remaining calm and planning. This is why you have governments set to basically do that, because otherwise just the fear and wild panic which occurs within people creates these problems which become worse and worse and are then unable to be salvaged by your ordinary systems and infrastructure. So how quickly a situation can be controlled will rely on good forward planning, careful resource management, so as to best weather unforeseen storms of instability. The main goal of course is to maintain civilian order as this will often as I say determine the long-term survival of regular order and recovery from shortages. Basically in situations where there are no plans to be put in place or a ruling order are incompetent in implementing a plan, order and institutional systems begin to buckle very quickly under the weight of civilian fear and disorder and this is when you're at risk of the full collapse of complex societies. Now for ourselves now on our world, we are of course aided by a close proximity to other countries and it's usually in their interest to make sure that their neighbours stay relatively stable. So this can in theory hopefully allow regions to pull together and share materials and you know help each other out as a means of preventing total societal collapse. Although it's fairly surprising how often this doesn't happen. Isolated places could often face far more severe disruption and this of course is assuming that we're just dealing with civilian problems, no military actions toward others, which there almost certainly would be in some regions and that of course further complicates the situation and very rarely in a constructive way. Now these examples can be aligned with the disruption that came at the end of mankind's golden age and as a result the way in which the Imperium now currently operates. Humanity at the end of the Golden Age had already faced severe disruption through its war with the Men of Iron and this was only further compounded by worlds becoming consumed by the horrors of the warp as they entered the Age of Strife. Now for many who were isolated this led to the complete destruction of their civilizations. They were unable to support themselves and were already weakened, unable to maintain order within their society which were then over time either all but destroyed or at least heavily compromised. They were reduced to basic more ancient worlds of a more feudal or even as I say barbaric nature. And this can happen when a society has become so advanced and complex that the only way to achieve forward progression is through highly specialized, highly educated people. The problem with this is that when you enter into a situation where those individuals are unable to fill those roles, no one can take that place, which leads again to a deteriorating situation and even a collapse. However, this is not necessarily always a bad thing. It can in fact be considered that instead this is even a natural process of humanity somewhat rebalancing itself. And again, this is a position we find ourselves in today in our modern world. As we become more and more reliant on technology, this requires people with higher education, higher technological understanding and associated skills. And if we were to face, say, a global pandemic of catastrophic levels, critical resource shortages, any loss of those key individuals, not necessarily even death, just that they're not there able to fulfill their duties, any loss of those people, their associated education systems, would devastate the normal order of things. And just how badly such losses would impact a society only grows as the complexity and compartmentalized nature of skills continues to narrow. Essentially, the more advanced we become, the more time, the more resources and systems are required to provide for those advanced workers that are needed. And because of the highly specialized nature of those workers, this is where we come to that point of diminishing returns. 
Essentially, it comes down to a pool of skills. If it becomes too damaged and reduced, this will have a crippling effect that will be very difficult to recover from. This is how an advanced society can quickly go into freefall and be reduced to an almost medieval level of technology. I think many of us would be surprised, or not surprised actually, by for example just how few people in an advanced society like we have today could for example make a fire. Something that we've been able to do from since the Stone Age, how many people could for example make metal? Would they be able to find the materials to do so and know how to do that? How many people understand how electricity works from a structure to gain it, to store it and then connect it and use it? To say nothing of medicine, engineering and so on. Or even how to just simply grow their own food, fish, make clothes and tools. So you see, when you really think about how an advanced civilization functions, most people rely heavily on the systems, the structures and the knowledge that are held together by highly compartmentalized, specialized workers. When parts of that system, for whatever reason, begin to collapse, it will usually create other problems which will spread and threaten to bring down other services, and this will then just continue to pull everything else apart. Now this might all sound very doomsday-ish, but it's really not. These kind of threats and disruption could and do occur, but what in all honesty could anybody do about it? Well usually the best thing that we can do to prevent these kind of things is good planning, good local systems that can operate independently from a centralized source of power. Management and stockpiling of resources obviously makes very good sense, yet most of this is fairly limited in scope because it's difficult for us to imagine what shape a major event could take. Because in cases of extreme disruption, usually others will step in if things become truly bad to prevent things from turning into a complete apocalypse. And this kind of intervention will usually occur during or after a conflict situation. Although it should be noted, not always. And again, we can readily see in our world today and in the past what happens when societal structure begins to deteriorate, often with some kind of military aspect to it as well, and other people don't get involved to stabilize that situation. It's not common that that situation resolves itself itself, usually the opposite, it will deteriorate and completely collapse. Now this might all sound wildly off topic at this point, but it's not. It's often been said that any civilization is just three missed meals away from anarchy, and this is absolutely applicable when it comes to the Imperium, more so perhaps even within its vast hive cities. So I just wanted to try and highlight why it is that during the Age of Strife, many worlds that seemed very advanced, seemed very stable, had a good sense of themselves and what they were doing, and very civilized planets collapsed into total societal anarchy. They suffered one or more of these two dangers, either loss of resources, you can liken the invasion of horrors from the warp even, like enslavers, much like a global pandemic, and the outcome of the devastating isolation and lack of resources during the Age of Strife means that in the Age of the Imperium, resources are managed as carefully as the bureaucracy of the Imperium allows. The general idea being that if someone needs more or less resources, it can control and shift those priorities to compensate. Now this of course sounds great on the face of things, but it doesn't necessarily work out that way. So worlds are still encouraged to be self-reliant. However, on worlds like Terra, or on planets where there are a great many hive cities, that is simply not possible, because for example on Terra, it's an ecumenopolis. And that's a world where the entire surface of the planet is just one massive city. Some worlds with hive cities that, as I say, have smaller populations are able to sustain themselves, but others rely entirely still on imports. When the Imperium was established, it was able to reconnect with many worlds and re-establish the network of trade between planets. And the Imperium is believed to, in its current time, constitute over one million worlds. The exact number or even location of these places is never fully known. Some will disappear from records, others are destroyed with little left to explain why that occurred. Planets now classed as resource worlds back in humanity's past might have had multiple roles and likely operated within their own plans of developing both self-sufficiency and their wider culture. But those days are long gone and now within the Imperium most of this has been stripped away during the Age of Strife. What was left of so many worlds had been consumed into the system and structure of the Imperium's bureaucracy. In fact, many planets within the Imperium are often singularly focused on one type of production, most often a single resource, but potentially it could also be more than one. Some have obvious descriptions, others are not so clear. Typically, the resource worlds are stated as being either feudal, feral, agricultural, mining, or industrial. Now, some of these are notably vague, but they're just for general designations. For example, an imperial civilized world, it sounds great on the surface, but just because that's its description, it just means that it's not in a constant state of combat and war and disorder. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a particularly safe place to live. 
Now while it might seem inefficient or even dangerous to have an entire planet focused on production of one thing, it's worth remembering that the Imperium also has entire worlds which are dedicated solely to say just commemorating battles, surfaces of worlds can be covered in tombs and magnificent vaulted arches, columns with memorials and giant statues that are visible even from orbit. It's also worth remembering that just because a world is designated as a primary producer of one thing, it doesn't mean that the entire surface of that planet is covered in habitation or resource management. In fact, this is not often the case. We tend to imagine this because we use Earth as a point of reference, but for many worlds in the Imperium, for example its hive cities, and associated resource production can be limited to one specific area or just dotted across the surface. Either way, in total, they'll usually only occupy a small percentage of the planet's total surface. It's probably also worth me reiterating at this point that it's important to remember how hive worlds can exist on worlds of any imperial classification. They can also exist as the standalone feature of a world. So just because a planet is feral, agricultural or whatever does not mean it cannot also contain a hive world. It's just that the hive is not necessarily the primary point of interest there. Feudal worlds are planets which either out of choice or never advanced to become a world which uses technology, or who have regressed to the point where they simply do not use it. While the Imperium may not necessarily push the advancement of tech, they may impart some technology to these worlds, both from a medical or production perspective, to ensure a world will remain stable and productive. And this can mean basic medicine or improved planning and machinery. A feudal world's status is usually in or around a late Iron Age but pre-industrial technological level and are very heavily focused often on agriculture. Now this can sound confusing when there is already another designation of agricultural or agri-worlds but as we'll come to that is quite different. A feudal world is simply a planet which is devoid of advanced tech and so by its nature this limits what activities of useful production can actually take place there. Some mining, farming but essentially basic production processes will be occurring. While feudal plants are technically a resource world because they can offer little else other than resources, their tithe grade will be very low for obvious reasons. But generally speaking, feudal worlds are more stable in the grand scheme of things because they're far less likely to suffer from internal political power struggles. Its citizens also are often highly wary of those which exhibit psychic powers and superstitions. Their awareness of anything that's out of the ordinary is very high, and this makes it easy for feudal world overseers to control pockets of mutants, unsanctioned psychers, cults and the like. In fact, it may even be a race to secure such individuals before the population themselves turn on them. The worlds are often very similar to Earth during the comparable age of technology. They're certainly capable of impressive feats of engineering, some metallurgy and a rudimentary knowledge of medicine. But beyond that, their lives are usually confined to roles which feature varying degrees of manual labour. Now, in some respects this is a fairly idyllic life, and while the work may be hard, its population are gifted by being able to live on worlds that are unlikely to be heavily polluted, subjected to endless gang violence or horrific campaigns of scouring by the Inquisition. Of course, the irony is that many of them will never actually be able to appreciate this fact, because while some will know that they are governed by the Imperium, this will likely not really mean very much beyond its title as a ruling system of governance. Even though some worlds are introduced in a more general way to the Imperium to help bridge the knowledge gap, most feudal citizens will have no true concept of the galaxy, its history, events or their place in it. The somewhat unusual, although within the Imperium, fairly standard aspect to feudal worlds is that they do not advance. One generation is much like the last and this will be due to the Imperium's continuing ongoing moratorium or, let's be more accurate, ban on invention and forward thinking. So unlike similar periods on Earth, the citizens will not be, say, spending time learning about the way that things work or coming up with new inventions. They'll follow their parents and learn their trade, eventually taking over to produce the next generation, and so on. Much of this stability comes from the security of their lives and the subsequent sense of hierarchical loyalty they pay to those in more senior positions above the peasantry right up to the imperial governor of their world. This heavily entrenched sense of loyalty and allegiance aligns well with the Imperium and so the citizenry of feudal worlds are often suitable for recruitment for the Militarum. Training programs would likely allow them a period to transition into understanding their wider place in the galaxy as well as the role required of them by the Imperium. 
For some, the shock though of these revelations can of course be too much and lead to them having a mental break or worse. For this reason, some worlds are chosen to be exposed to the Imperium as a whole through descriptions that are designed to be more easy for them to understand and limit the cultural shock that may occur. And the aim of this is to bring them collectively into an understanding of their place within the Imperium and where their loyalties need to be. So in some sense, the Imperium does attempt to advance these feudal worlds, at least in a sense of just their knowledge of the place within the galaxy and what that may mean for them as a society. This thankfully is usually a very effective way to maximise the potential of a feudal world. Its citizens and warriors, having lived fairly blissful lives relatively speaking, feel a strong sense of loyalty to protect the land that they love and of course its place in the Imperium. Recruits from feudal worlds are known to be a good source of manpower for the Militarum and also often for the Astartes. They also perhaps unexpectedly make good recruitment material for administrative roles. Now the reason for this might not seem immediately obvious. But when you consider that many Hive citizens spend their days pressing buttons and essentially being human parts in a vast machine of fabrication, they need to know very little other than to just do whatever that one thing is that they're assigned and then that's all they do. Feudal citizens, however, will need to know things like seasons for farming, how to track that time scale, trading between towns and cities on a small personal and larger scale. And while there is no officially approved Imperium currency for regular citizens, some worlds may use a token system, essentially something akin to a proto-currency. It's often likely mixed with a barter system. They'll often also have to do things like keeping track of stock, engineering, resource management, and so on. So all of this means that by a cruel mockery of fate, some feudal citizens may objectively be better educated, for want of a better word, than those working in highly advanced hive manufactorums. Consequently, this means feudal citizens may be assessed in taking positions within the Imperial Administratum because of their skills with memory and organisation. And so, you end up in this weird upside-down world where you might have people who have come from a feudal world actually overseeing people who originated from a hive world. It's a very, very upside-down sort of process. Now, it goes without saying that the Ministorum, that is the Ecclesiarchy, have a solid presence on most feudal worlds. On that side of things, their life couldn't be easier. An already highly suspicious and simple society living in blissful ignorance, it's most certainly one of the more preferable assignments for members of the Ecclesiarchy compared to the hellish planets some may find themselves sent to in order to carry out their missionary work. Feudal worlds often prove good recruitment, as we've said, for Adeptus Sororitas for the same reason as they do Guardsmen and Astartes. Feudal worlds can make good sources also for Imperial Psychers who, if they're identified by citizens as being some kind of witch or sorcerer, are able to be secured, ready for transport aboard greatly feared black ships. But that's of course providing the citizenry don't just immediately string them up and burn them alive. Now we are focused on the resource worlds of the Imperium today, but I just wanted to make this small note to say that many, but not necessarily all feudal worlds, can also contain Imperial Knights. These massive mech suits are piloted by a nobility usually long established on their worlds, often tracing right back to before the Imperium even existed. Each noble will have a powerful bond with their knight, and it's through this bond that first sparked the entire practice of knights protecting feudal worlds. The shortened version is that long ago during the Dark Age of Technology, the newly settled worlds of mankind were looking to exploit the rich resources like agriculture, fertility, mining operations and so on. These early colonies though were often subjected to ongoing harassment by indigenous or otherwise alien threats, and in order to protect the colonists who had often had to strip down their ships of all materials in order to build their new colonies would look to their STC systems which would subsequently enable the development as a countermeasure for them the night suits across many worlds. As is often the case with the STC designs, many of these suits were similar in construction and that's why they appear fairly standardised when they're found throughout the galaxy. The night suits were beyond the capability for most Xenos to be able to counteract them at the time and proved highly effective for these worlds in defending themselves. What came next though was an unforeseen consequence of this development. The pilots of knights would interface with the knight's machine spirit through something described as the throne mechanicum. This is basically the piloting seat for the knight. Because knights, after all, are basically scaled down titans. Now the result was that the human pilots would forge an ever-strengthening bond with the knight machine, not dissimilarly to princeps. 
Now for those early colonists, this process would gradually alter their minds, leading them to feel an ever stronger, almost unbreakable sense of loyalty, not only to their knight, but also to their world and their citizenry, because after all, that's what they had been designed to do. That was their role, their purpose, and so what was, I guess, input into the STC eventually bled through into the mind of the pilot themselves. And this had a direct impact on the cultural development of these worlds and the early knights that developed into what is now referred to as the nobility, or what are also often referred to as the highborn citizens of the Imperium. Although obviously not all highborn pilot knights, but all knight pilots are usually exclusively nobility, they're highborn. Now, as a result of this, the worlds were seen by humanity at this time as becoming more conservative and more insular. This is still in the Golden Age. And these worlds would begin to reject advances in human technology as they were just content to provide resources and they were slowly then sidelined by the wider network of human colonies in the early days of man's expansion. This almost mocking sidelining approach to the backward ways of the night world would come back to severely bite on most worlds of the human empire in the Dark Age because this rejection of technology meant that they inadvertently avoided the worst of the war with the men of iron because they had minimal AI presence on their worlds due to the feudal nature of their planets. Additionally, during the onset of the Age of Strife, the nature again of the planet's citizenry meant that as soon as any unusual psychers would emerge, they were almost immediately put to death. And this also limited the impact of the psychic horrors who were breaking into reality from the warp. By contrast, the other worlds within the Imperium who had maybe survived the war with the Men of Iron, who were very advanced, very progressive thinking, very forward thinking, very open to this new development in human ability, those worlds were often completely destroyed as the psychic horrors wrought terrible destruction on the people of those planets. So it's fairly ironic that the more uneducated and technologically rejected, conservative, suspicious worlds were the ones which actually survived. And so you can see again how all of that kind of bleeds into the kind of modern Imperium and how it sort of perceives things. Basically, by the time we got to the Imperium, feudal night worlds gel very, very well with where the Imperium has come to be. And in many ways, you could almost say that they were a sign of what was to come with the age of the Imperium. And it almost goes back to what I was saying earlier about complex societies rebalancing themselves almost as a necessity. So while night worlds may have been seen as backward by the humans during the Golden Age, they have become almost this perfect template by which the Imperium now operates. Namely, don't trust AI because it will threaten to destroy all, purge and burn the heretic wherever you find them. Most importantly, kill the Xenos. Do not hesitate because they will not hesitate to kill you. Feral worlds are a step down again from feudal worlds, usually in just about every respect. They frequently have less of any societal structure, regularly less technology, a far less safe environment, and from the Imperium's point of view, far less to offer. Most often its inhabitants will be tribal, nomadic or semi-nomadic. Small encampments or shantytowns may exist in selected environmental areas or the ancient ruined structures of its old, former advanced world, but rarely anything more than that. Those living on a feral world can often range from relatively peaceful tribes who just hunt indigenous life and basically just exist, to crazed apocalyptic warriors who battle in the destroyed ruins of hive cities in essentially an unending war of gang attrition. Sometimes if the resources are available, they may even be crazed fights in speed machines battling across toxic wastelands for the scant remains of a world long forgotten. Now, feral worlds are somewhat surprisingly, due to their devastated apocalyptic nature, actually fairly comparable to other imperial worlds. On the more violent feral areas of a planet, say, long abandoned hive cities, their living conditions are likely not significantly different, or indeed any safer, than many hive worlds. The absence and ignorance of knowledge is very likely comparable, as is their awareness that forward progression is a possibility. The ecclesiarchy will often have an interest in these worlds just as they do anywhere else. Many inhabitants of a feral world would often have some vague notion about a star god or star father, some mythical legend from eons ago. And this makes it a little easier for any missionaries to blend the imperial creed into their local culture. And feral worlds are not always dusty wastelands. They can be jungle worlds, icy tundras, volcanic plains, or even planets with a combination of biomes. Each may have more or less long abandoned levels of technology, and occasionally such worlds may be of interest to the Mechanicus, or indeed Imperial archaeologists who spend their time seeking out archaeotech. 
This is relics from the dark age of technology that may reside in the ruined fragments of what may be the remnants of first settlers. Colonists from the golden age were not always successful and may have perished within the early period when arriving upon a world. Their vast ships may reside somewhere under the surface of a planet now long since buried by millennia of environmental attrition. And the discovery of an intact Dark Age vessel with all of its relevant technology, perhaps even still a sentient AI system on board, would wet the lips of any Mechanicus explorer, if they still had any lips of course, which they usually do not. The whys and wherefores when it comes to the existence of a feral world are just about as many as you could think of. A failed colony from the Golden Age, a hive city which tore itself apart during the Age of Strife, how about a lost transport ship which just lost its way and crash landed millennia ago without deploying an emergency transmission? For whatever reason they find themselves there, it's unlikely many if any of its inhabitants would be aware of the Imperium any longer. And if they did through ancient stories passed down generation to generation, it's probable that they would regard the Imperium as some kind of star tribe or perhaps even some kind of pantheon of ruling gods. The planet itself will be subject to a tithe grade, albeit almost always at the lowest level, and will be usually assigned a governor who will oversee the planet, and these are usually kept in orbit so as to best avoid the regularly dangerous conditions, but also their job is usually to ensure that they report in on and limit the spread of extreme cults, which could eventually transition into chaos cults. Now similarly to feudal worlds, the technological divide between the inhabitants and the wider Imperium is a continual problematic issue. They're unlikely to be exposed to the reality of the Imperium, as can happen with a feudal world, but those who are recruited from feral worlds because of perhaps their fighting prowess and are ready to be tested out for the Astartes will undoubtedly face a massive cultural adjustment when exposed to things like warp travel or just the members of the Imperium like say the Mechanicus. Another reason for keeping separation for the overseeing governors is to prevent them from becoming too heavily embedded within the planet's culture. Because of a governor's access to advanced tech, they can sometimes be seen by the tribes on a feral world as some kind of celestial god. This situation runs the risk of the governor becoming power mad and eventually seeing themselves actually in that role. In the past these kind of figures can create all manner of problems for the Imperium, the influence of chaos being the most obvious. The changer of the ways is always especially sensitive to those who seek power and expansion of their control. Agri-worlds are one of the more straightforward resource planet types because they're often semi-automated. They usually require comparatively minimal populations and as a result often do not require governorship as there are far fewer people or civilian infrastructure systems to govern over. Many agri-worlds will simply have Adeptus Administratum staff who manage the planet more like a factory. And this usually means careful management of data and maintaining maximum levels of efficiency. And this may seem like a tedious or even a boring assignment, but as per any area of the administratum, those who make continual or even singular mistakes, the consequences can be high. Likely they may be dropped back to the role of a hive worker or worse sent to a penal colony. The punishments for error within the administratum are harsh because just as with most roles in the bureaucracy, their accurate management will dictate the stable production of produce from these worlds and that's critical to the smooth running, indeed the very survival, of many hive worlds. The only reason many administrators avoid consequence in making errors is that often by the time an error within the human machine of the administratum actually has an effect, and by effect I mean the potential death of a world, by the time that occurs, tracing it back to the source may be near impossible, and that's if the guilty administrator would even be alive by the time that they were able to do so. An agri-world will often but not exclusively have been almost completely converted for the production of agriculture, and their tithe grades are unsurprisingly nearly entirely based on produce and often pretty high. However, this does not necessarily mean that they are exclusively farmed using every scrap of space with huge fields. Some may focus on very specific areas of high production, Others feature vast oceans, teeming with fish and other aquatic life. Land areas can be dedicated to livestock production as well, where it's efficient to do so. Livestock that is often of a fairly xenos nature, of course, and it's worth remembering that although humanity despises alien life, this is usually most focused on sentient alien life that poses a direct threat to mankind. Indigenous animal life is not seen in perhaps the same way. In fact, on many worlds, alien life will have all manner of uses that's blended into the culture. Anyway, back to agri-worlds. The products of agri-worlds are vast and could be singularly focused on one type of product or a variety of things, from crops to livestock, fungus, algae production, even insect farming. Usually anything that can provide nutrition for the people of the Imperium. 
what will be produced is very much an open-ended question. When you spread the possibilities across the entire galaxy, the variety of products is very high. Not to mention, of course, when we say agri-world, we automatically think farming or produce. But many worlds designated as agri could be used to produce vast quantities of water. And this is critical for many hive worlds where their natural water sources have either dried up or become irreparably contaminated. Once you realise that some hive worlds rely on other planets to deliver their water to them, or at least to periodically refresh their water processing systems, you can understand why warp storm isolation can lead very quickly to devastating consequences for some planets. While there are a wide variety of angry worlds, many focus on producing what could be described as staple foodstuffs. And these are usually easiest to produce in bulk, to store, transport and manipulate into whatever product is required by, say, a hive world. However, some worlds will focus on rarer products that happen to be in abundance on, say, just one specific world. This will often mean that these products represent a rarity, items that are seen within the Imperium as a delicacy, and when it comes to the question of food and drink within the Imperium, while well, many hive citizens will be left eating reprocessed slop, starchy cube biscuits of questionable origins, other worlds like feudal planets and the upper echelons of a hive city, the spread of food across a table can be considerably more rich and varied. There are some descriptions of food and drink within the lore, but it's actually sadly a very poorly fleshed out side of one of the more potentially fun sides of the verse. There's definitely room for some fan fictionalization, methinks, on the Lutin Necropolis. But as for the inhabitants of Angry Worlds, while the populations will usually be considerably smaller than many planets, it will vary greatly between Angry Worlds, obviously because it's dictated by the type of product and the nature of the work being carried out. Some of the workers will live in small towns on the surface, others may live in orbit above a planet, descending to specific areas en masse to carry out harvesting or planting operations. This is especially necessary on large planets which may have a slow rotation, as entire areas of the planet may be unusable for entire seasons. So the carefully administrative nature might sound like working on an agri-world is something of a decent role to participate in within the wider picture of the Imperium. Not necessarily. Working on an agri-world is often exhausting, dirty and a very high pressure role. The demands of the administrators are unrelenting and most workers will be pushed to the very limit of their physical capability, what can essentially be efficiently gained from their toiling. As with much of the Imperium, workers are treated more like organic machinery than any concern for individual welfare. When that piece of machinery breaks, you just will replace it. But because of the nature of the work, similar to many intensive production processes, the workers will build a strong sense of camaraderie and community. This means that they're very good at pulling together to get things done, but it also means that they're less willing to oust those within their midst who present, say, signs of psychic ability or mutation. And this can cause issues for administrators, and so they'll often pay very close attention to not only the data that they see, but any changes also in attitude from workers or observations of physical difference. And if they suspect this, unfortunately for the workers, there may be a need for Inquisition involvement. Mining and quarry worlds are another fairly self-explanatory planet type. They're rich in mineral or material wealth, sometimes even natural gases that are used for chemicals or solid material like the highly valuable blackstone. Their populations will extract from often deep underground vast veins of material for either fabrication on the surface or transport to forge worlds and hive manufactorums. The work here is understandably dangerous and dirty, and while some may have automation, others may be entirely worked by human labour. And while this can be a planet's population, it's equally likely to be a penal labour force who may well spend the entire remainder of their lives underground, managed by hardened members of the Adeptus Arbites. Similarly to agri-worlds, mining worlds will, for obvious reasons, evolve a workforce with a sense of camaraderie and support for each other. This is highly important when working within the dangerous conditions of a mining world, and so as to be highly aware of the dangers and limit industrial accidents. But a mining or quarry world, unlike an agri-world, may be managed by a governor or even ruling house nobility, as a mining world will often exist alongside other activities and designations like a hive city, shrine world, and so on. It's one of the planet types that is more likely to be found combined with others. Dependent on the environmental conditions of the planet, its population may exist above or below ground, and of course some mining worlds are plagued by Xenos who exist within the darkened tunnels and caverns below the surface, like for example the greatly feared Ambor. Many mining worlds will also have a religious presence, the ecclesiarchy very likely exploiting the fears of workers to maximise their commitment to the faith, and many workers 
daily prayers will be necessary blessings before they head down into the depths and these for them are absolutely essential to ensure they receive protection to get them through their shifts. While undoubtedly important, mining and quarry worlds are not critically essential to the survival of other worlds within the Imperium from a daily survival perspective. Of course, this is not the case in times where sectors of the galaxy are facing severe threats and require maximum output of manufactured military hardware, but by and large if a mining world is cut off for a period of time or has issues with its production, the Imperium can usually traverse the problem with limited impact compared to say agricultural worlds, feudal worlds and so on. And then lastly we come to industrial worlds. Now these again are less complex in one way or another, but only in the sense that they're fairly common across the Imperium. But there is a difference to draw between what is considered a pure industrial world and an industrial hive world. Because most hive worlds are at least to some degree industry focused. The lower levels of a hive often contain manufactorums, which focus on the production of all manner of materials to both keep the hive itself functioning, equipment to its defence forces, and of course supply surrounding worlds in a system with whatever they may need. In stark contrast though to industrial hive worlds, pure industrial worlds are usually actually low population and largely automated. They can range from chemical production to mineral extraction or just the refining and combination of materials. These planets are very similar to agri-worlds, usually they have a small administrative team overseeing who will organise and dictate to the workers what they need to be doing at a certain time, and for pure industrial worlds that's about it. They're fairly straightforward affairs, but just like all the cogs in the Imperial machine, they're essential to the stability of the Imperium. While many industrial worlds are subject to the Imperial tithe, others like for example the industrialised worlds of the Ultramar system are dedicated entirely to serving the Astartes chapter which rule their system. And this means that they're exempt from wider Imperial command and follow the orders dictated to them by the Space Marine chapter which rule their system. Now hive worlds, as I said, are also another form of industrial planet. The industrialised nature of hive worlds is almost always the reason why their surrounding areas are so heavily polluted with industrial runoff, contamination and just waste dumping of chemicals, materials, things that are unable to be recycled and so on. The wasteland surrounding hive cities can stretch for hundreds of miles and has often been ruined by millennia of continual contamination. The heavy pollution usually means that whatever ecosystem existed on the planet collapsed long ago, or if it does exist, it's far away from the hive city on the other side of a world. Most often though, planets with heavy industry are barren wastelands completely inhospitable, apart from the vast spire cities that punctuate its surface. The importance of a hive world and hive cities being able to produce their own equipment should not be underestimated. Similarly to the production of food, either within a system or on a world itself, a hive world's ability to supply its own forces can be equally critical to its very survival. Within the empire of the Imperium, many worlds may not be able to request reinforcements in time, or even if they do, there's actually no guarantee of just when that help may arrive. So in the interim period, they will have to survive on their own. Most hive worlds will have a substantial PDF force, which even if it's a very small percentage of the total hive city, will often number in the tens of millions. Similarly, stationed Imperial Guard armies will also number greatly into the millions, and the military forces of a hive city may feature heavy armour, even Imperial Knights. So keeping this all maintained and supplied can be the very difference between survival and complete apocalypse for hive worlds. Industrial worlds and their manufactorums of course supply all manner of products, not necessarily only military, to other worlds. They can provide the tools and machines necessary for all the resource worlds that we've looked at, and often this will take place within a single system, but there's nothing to say that hardware couldn't be transported further away if necessary. Also, unlike most of the more specialised resource worlds, industrial worlds can be more flexible in what it is that they're producing. So it could be civilian tools at one time, but as the situation changes, this can be shifted to a more military stance. Basically, the industrial manufacturing system exists to supply whatever is most needed at a given time. Its ability to do this efficiently is likely its more critical aspect, and that rests heavily upon its governor, planetary nobles, overseers and security forces. Unlike most of the other resource worlds, industrial worlds can be potentially more unstable. And this is usually because they're situated within hive cities. And the nature of high concentrations of people, often living in less than stellar conditions, can lead to crime, violence, obscure cults, and resentment toward the ruling classes. Sabotage may be something that has to be dealt with, 
as can health issues with so many living in such close and regularly unsanitary conditions. Due to the high populations of hive cities, anything other than a mass pandemic or huge riots is going to have only a limited impact on production, because there are always more people willing to work. Work usually means access to credits, and credits mean they secure a more stable source of nourishment and mildly better quarters than some. And I should say again that credits in hive cities are by no way a standardized system of currency. They're again more like a token system often used just within that hive as a way to give its population access to small benefits. It's more like monopoly money which doesn't possess any real value and can only be used to access specific perks often only open to hive workers and it can vary wildly across hive cities as dictated by the ruling powers. Life for workers on an industrial or hive industrial world, as you might imagine, not especially pleasant. They're hot, loud, dirty, often extremely dangerous, or perhaps on the sunny side, mind-numbingly dull, to the point that you would just wish you were dead anyway. The best way to describe life for an industrial worker is to understand their importance in the sense that they have no importance. Some of you may remember a while back where I described the process of refueling a starship within the Imperium and how a selected condemned few are saturated with drugs and other things before they're sent into the core room of a ship. Its extremely hazardous environment will then lead to the total disintegration of their bodies. Now this did confuse many people who questioned the necessity for using human workers in this way, condemned or otherwise, when you could just use, say, an automated system. And this is really actually a critical point of understanding when it comes to the Imperium that I think I have highlighted a few times. That point being that you are not important. You're less than important. You are in irrelevancy. You don't hold any value. Because of the very nature of the Imperium, machines and technology are far more important than any ordinary pleb citizen or civilian. As a worker, you are a tiny fractional piece of the great machine of the Imperium. You exist to be consumed, and when your body is broken or unable to continue, you will likely be recycled to become a product for further industrial use, or of course, food for your fellow citizens. A single hive city contains anything between 10 and up to 100 billion citizens. Now if you were going about your working day in one of those hive cities manufactorum, and you happen to get your arm trapped within the internal workings of a machine that serves that mass of people, the only important thing is going to be ensuring that that machine continues to operate as quickly as possible. So brace yourself for the impending chopping. Industrial and hive industry worlds will also be subject to greater pressure to meet imperial tithes, which for hive and industrial worlds will often place on the mid or higher end of the tithe grade. And this is another reason why your importance is almost non-existent when the overseers who answer through a hive's chain of command right up to the nobility or the governorship are going to be singularly concerned with ensuring that their tithe is met so as to not warrant undue attention from the administratum or worse, the inquisition. Now lastly, when we're talking about industry, there is a product that the Imperium requires continually which is far more important than weapons, steel, alloys, silica, acids, chemicals, clothing, ammunition, or industrial hardware. A disposable product which is far more important than any of this. Hive cities, industrial or otherwise, will endlessly manufacture this resource, which the Imperium of Man will consume and burn through almost more readily than anything else with a cruel and emotionless greed. A resource with which the Imperium will use to solve almost any and all of its problems, and without which would likely fall to many of its most voracious enemies. And that resource which the Imperium holds in abundance is, of course, people. <laughs>